ALIP and New North London. And DY holds degrees in film and television and Jewish education and is currently writing a thesis on kindness as part of the progressive rabbinic decision-making decision progress. DY, I'm looking forward to reading your thesis. Uh, thank you very much. It's so lovely to see all of you. I've got all of you up as like little squares on my screen, uh, but uh, it's a lovely way to spend a Friday night. Um, I was really enjoying that discussion. And, uh, you know, I actually think that it's through those tensions that we find good ways of moving forward. Um, and, you know, I, I recall I was reading uh, Jonathan Safran Foer's book, Eating Animals, and he talks an awful lot about that emotional connection that we have uh, with food, particularly within a religious tradition uh, and culture. And I definitely can relate to that. Uh, my my home is meat free, uh, but it's, it's hard, you know, with that relationship with my mother's and my grandmother's recipes that have been passed down. And I always do sometimes, uh, I often think about what's now happened with those recipes. How are those being passed down as well? Um, it was funny, you know, I met with Rabbi Tanya and uh, we were having a conversation, nothing to do with Eco Shabbat. And I feel like at the end, I was just mentioning a few uh, uh, things in my lifestyle about how I try and uh, manage being sustainable. And she said, oh, you should come and speak here. So it's my pleasure. Um, I wonder if people are familiar with the term Baal Teshuva. So Baal Teshuva, have you heard of that term? Do you want to just put your hand up? So uh, literally translates as master of return, though understood as master of returning to God. It's often a phrase used uh, in the Orthodox Jewish world uh, to mean someone who has come from being secular or not religious and who has returned uh, to Jewish practice. Uh, but in one sense, I am a Baltashuva. Uh, I'm not a Baltashuva. I guess I'm almost a convert to progressive Judaism, and I'll explain exactly what I mean. Um, but my uh, my in into Judaism, into progressive Judaism, was largely for its tremendous commitment to caring and helping others. And I hope what I uh, what I want to kind of give is a semi outsider insider perspective as to why I think progressive Judaism particularly has a very unique role to play when it comes to sustainability and social justice. So I grew up within an observant Orthodox Jewish family in Hendon, which is a little place in London many people have heard of where there's quite a large Orthodox Jewish community. And whilst my parents gave me many wonderful uh, religious experiences, from a young age I yearned uh, for something a little bit different. And when I was in my early 20s, uh, I made one final attempt to embrace the Orthodoxy of my youth spending a summer in a Haredi-led uh, yeshiva in Jerusalem. Uh, Haredi, I'm not always really sure the best way to translate it, but most people would say ultra-Orthodox. Um, but I acknowledge that that can be a problematic term too. Um, and it very quickly became apparent, uh, at least to me, that this particular approach to Judaism and the wider world was not going to be for me. But there was one thing in particular uh, that inspired me. And that was uh, each Friday, students were dismissed early from their shirim, from their classes, and they were instructed to go out into the local community to assist them in their preparations for Shabbat. And the activity that I was assigned to uh, involved collecting and distributing meal packages for financially struggling uh, families. And this was uh, right next to Mer Shirim, uh, a Haredi community in Jerusalem. And at the end of my time in uh, time there in the yeshiva, I reflected, I may no longer be interested in religious Judaism. The, the yeshiva really, uh, um, in many ways, did not uh, did not reinforce that, that was the way I wanted to experience or practice being Jewish. But what is my excuse for not taking a more active role in caring for others? And so my big takeaway from my time there as I made my way home as a secular Jew uh, was that I vowed to be uh, less self-centered. And when I got back to the UK at university, I immediately sought out various social justice societies. And there was one in particular that caught my attention. And little did I know then that by joining the university's Aegis Society, and that's a group which campaigns for better genocide awareness and education, that would be the catalyst for my 
re-entry into religious Judaism. And why was this so significant and how does this connect to uh, progressive Judaism? Well, you see the Aegis Society, whilst made up of people from across the campus and across the religious spectrum, uh, had a significant portion of its members who were engaged progressive Jews. And this for me was my first time really having conversations with people who were uh, outside of the orthodox Jewish world. And together with my new friends, they helped me to explore new approaches to my religion from reform and Mazzotti to liberal and reconstructionalist. And, uh, you know, I, I remember making a diary entry at the time and I described this new world that I was encountering uh, as uh, having fluid boundaries and being very multicolored. But it was these conversations that led me to reconnect with Judaism and ultimately to study for the rabbinate of which I'm in my final year. So this is one of the core strengths and values of progressive Judaism. It looks, out, it looks outwards at our world while also actively seeking to care for everything living within it. And what really I admired about uh, the people I was encountering was it wasn't just about helping our own community. It was holding on to that larger picture, uh, that larger vision of, that we are all deeply interconnected. And this has been at the centre of my work, both within cross-communal Jewish organisations, as well as within specific synagogues. But you see, I believe that a commitment to say sustainability can not only save our fragile planet, but it can also help mend ever-increasing rifts between different groups of people. Eco Synagogue and the next 25 hours Eco Shabbat are a testament to our ability to put aside differences and come together for all our sakes. In the microcosm that is Judaism, it is inspiring to see committed communities from Mazorti, Reform, United Synagogue and Liberal Judaism. However, I do not believe that it is simply the threat of climate change that has pulled these diverse voices together, but an understanding by all parties that together we really can make a difference. In this sense, we validate our own agency, but also the power of others. And while we may disagree on the details, I believe that all humanity Every living person wants a planet upon which they can thrive. And in this sense, it is possible for us to extend the umbrella of sustainability, uh, sustainability sustainable committed communities to include active partners from the most Haredi to the most secular. So I'm a rabbinical student, so you'll have to give me, forgive me for tying in this week's Torah portion at least uh, a little bit. In this week's Torah portion, told up, we read about the births of Yaakov and Esau, Jacob and Esau, and the Torah tells us that even in the womb, these two brothers struggled against one another, causing their mother great pain. And this led Rebecca Rivka to ask out loud, if this is so, why do I exist? Or as Dr. Ellen Frankel suggests, we could also read, if my two children are destined to be at each other's throats, what is my purpose as a parent? And God responds to Rivka, to Rebecca, pointing out that Two nations are in your womb, two separate people shall issue from your body. But the reality, two separate people, but only one planet to share. And that's the case for all of us. Now, the world is so much bigger than the womb, yet both are our lifeline. And as unborn babies, we live within this small, perfectly balanced ecosystem that provides for our every need. Yet, as babies and children, we do not see our shared sources of life only our immediate wants and needs. And for me, Judaism can address this adolescent perception of reality, inviting us to reconnect with the planet and in turn, all those living things upon it. And that is why the dangers of climate change and the lack of sustainability require people from all walks of life to come together. This cannot be an individual endeavor. If only some countries or religions or cultures are on board whilst we exclude others, or allow them to exclude themselves, we revert back to Jacob and Esau in the womb, unable to cooperate and ultimately unable to share this earth. Sustainability, therefore, is not only essential for our physical survival, but it is also a much needed antidote to human beings' inherent drive towards tribalism. And so to finish, where do we begin? Well, the answer is short. Here and now, as a community willing to change together, and willing to work together with anyone and everyone to save our planet. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, and thank you so much, D.Y. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask D.Y. questions at the end. We're going to hold all the questions till 
um, the last um, 15 minutes or so after Miriam's talk as well, so that you can put questions to both our speakers. But that was such an inspiration. Your ability to cross boundaries in terms of your religious background and your ability to cross boundaries in terms of your thinking as well teaches so much about how we can think about issues together and how important it is is to really unite for the climate and for each other so thank you very much for inspiring us my pleasure and now it's my pleasure to introduce miriam kennett and miriam i know it's very difficult for you to join us today it would have been hard anyway because you're so involved with cop 26 and you've been organizing your delegation there helping them to make an impact at the conference and encourage um all the delegates towards the goals and the actions that are needed but of course you also lost your friend and colleague and co-founder of the green economics institute this week so we do feel for you and we are so thankful that nevertheless you're going to be speaking to us there's lots i could say about miriam oh. but i will keep it short because we want to hear her thank but you miriam and i have been friends since childhood really and even then when miriam was really the big sister to um my friend her younger sister <laughs> even then Miriam's originality, energy and in intelligence were all clear to us. She's been active in the Green Party long, I think when it was still called the Ecological Party, in fact, if I remember rightly, um, some of us may remember. And then she founded the Green Economics Institute and has been named as one of the 100 most powerful unseen global women to change the world. She also was a founder and editor of the International Journal of Green Economics. Um, she's one of the foremost thinkers, I think, on green issues. And as I said, her Econ Green Economic Institute has been a real presence at COP. So Miriam's going to talk to us a little bit about that and about what is happening and what we can be doing. So I'm going to hand over to Miriam now. Okay, well, thank you so much. That's so kind. And I'm just kind of, that's it, yes. Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, great honor to be able to address you all today. Um, and as you said, I want to honor the person I set the Institute up with, Volker Heinemann, who passed away, we found out today. So really quite difficult, you know, um, but we wouldn't have a COP delegation without him. So I thought it was right to do this. Um, and so um, I want to, I thought I'd do something quite different. So I've just come down from the COP, I've been in the COP this week. Um, and so I wanted to just give you a, sh a view of what it's like, share with you some pictures, some things we're doing. And I thought I'd take you inside the COP because actually I worked out the virtual COP um, it's something that I've managed to wangle, so I've got it on my machine and I can share it with you. So I thought I might perhaps start with that so you can see what it's like to be in there in different different ways, you know, um, and see what it's trying to do. So that might just give you a feel for what it's like and then also what we can achieve. So I thought I'd perhaps do that, share some stuff with you, and then you can get a feel and then we can talk about what it's doing and that's ask questions if that would be all right. So the first thing is, um, I thought I'll try and share with you our exhibition stand. So all the kind of, um, we're a Ringo research organization of the COP. There are lots of different parts of the COP. So you, if you like, it's the United Nations. So we have four negotiators for each nation on earth. And this is something I think is the highest human endeavor. It's, it's exactly what it says in the Bible, bringing together all those nations, people working together. And if you imagine what that's like, you go in a room, and it's, if you think of the United Nations floor, it's that, it's sort of, I haven't got the picture of those, I think I might be able to show you. Each country has a little plaque and it says England or whatever. And then there's a thing, 
that says Ringo Bingo, whatever. And these are the little NGOs, the farming communities, the young communities, the indigenous communities. They all have a seat in the room, United Nations itself, they call the UNFCCC, which is the United Nations part that does the climate change. You usually have, you can have the head of the United Nations, Antonio Gutierrez, and you have all these different interests in the room. And today, the biggest, noisiest one is the people outside the room, which is the um, people doing climate action. And they're very much part of it. And the politicians, in their countries, the states want the people outside to push because it's hard. If you imagine, I wonder if you can imagine you're a government and you know you've got to make change, probably you've got good these action, these activists who are outside the room, they're reflecting public opinion and they're pushing other states to go further, to go faster. And what we call it is ratcheting up faster climate ambition and climate action. So if you like this kind of COP, it may sound very dry, but actually it's an incredibly vibrant, colorful, exciting gathering of representatives of humanity. And the question is, what is that? You know, in 500 years ago, it would have been a few kings and noblemen. Today, it's all sorts of people from all backgrounds. And my delegation has 60 people. And I think there's probably 60 different nationalities from all over the world. We've got indigenous people, we've got people from the North Pole, we've got people, indigenous people from Africa, farmers from all over the place. And so it's a global gathering and it's really good. And this year, we were granted um, delegation all predicated on the idea of inter really, in some ways radical, you wouldn't expect to find it. Intersectionality, diversity, gendered, inclusive um, and indigenous. And that is what we're giving, what we're allowed to do um, as a research organisation. And if you think back a few years, people would say, oh, no, I can't do that. They grant us each time a bigger and bigger delegation to do that. So let me just show you a few pictures that I've got ready for you, if I can do it. Uh, so this one, this is how, when you go into, this is actually inside the environment. Um, I don't know if I can show you yet. Yeah. Maybe I'll show you this. It's absolutely terrible to load this thing. This is the virtual COP26 platform. All the delegates have access to this and you need a pass normally to get in. So you have to put your passport in and a hundred other things to show that you're you. And then this is what it looks like when you arrive. And many delegates will never get beyond this because perhaps they couldn't travel, you know, in another country or something, or perhaps if COVID gets bad. So can you see, this is what it looks like. And these are the different things that you can go to, okay? So can you see that all right? So some events is what they call the kind of event that I will be holding. I'm holding one of those next Thursday and it's official, you have to bid for it. And the way the UN works is you can't go in and say, I wanna do this. You have to ally with other organizations and the more diverse they are, we have to actually put in the kind of um, gender percentage, the uh, LGBT plus percentage, all those things. And then when we bid with other organizations from around the world, um, I don't know, it could be a university, it could be an action thing, it could be representative of women, indigenous people, farming, it could be forest, whatever it is. And it has to have a cohesive narrative. And ours, as I say, was intersectionality, inclusion, faster ambition, this sort of thing. And then you have the heads of delegations, the, the officials there, the COP presidency, you may know is Alok Sharma, observers, all sorts and all the meeting rooms, right? And you can go in there. And then these are the working groups of the UN, which you take part in, but they, this is, they report at the COP, but the work goes on all year. So you can, I've been a rapporteur for some of these, it's really interesting, all the things they're trying to do. So it might have headlines, you know, there's lots of headlines that, you know, oh, it's this, it's that, and whatever. There's a huge amount of effort, huge amount of science that goes on behind it uh, to make it work. And they all report back at this annual thing, which is called a COP. Um, so I quite often go in the week, in the year and do other stuff. So then we have, um, what else, virtual exhibits. So I've got a virtual exhibit, which again, you have to bid for and you have to ally with other humans across the planet. So um, that, there's lots, can you see? They're all different, can you see these? Can you see those? Is it, is it showing out? Yeah. So these are all the 
And so these are the official exhibits that are part of the COP narrative, if you like. And you can see they're very diverse. Um, and there's lots of protest groups that are allowed in now right into the core of it, you know, which is really good. And I'll just show you our one quickly because that'll be interesting. And I've got a few more bits to show you. It'll open. It's always an issue about opening on Zoom. So this is our virtual exhibit. There was a lot of problems this year with this, the talks that we wrote about how to change the world, um, which you can see on that and I can send you afterwards. And then this is, we're allowed some videos. Uh, and this is me giving a speech at Katowice COP. Um, and I wondered, maybe just like to have a look because it gives a flavor of perhaps what's happening at this one, if it'll work. I don't know if it will. It's a bit raw because my voice is horrific, but just give you a feeling of what happened. So that one I did with Greta was also on the platform. Um, and we were invited by um, Eva Sufin, who um, is an activist. But you can see that we're arguing for two tons of carbon per person by 2022, which is halving the carbon we were using. So the global average carbon usage today, as it was then, was 4.9 tons of carbon per person per year, and that's wrecked the climate. So we argue the half the carbon per person all, all over the planet, and we did this from the carbon budget, we calculated it, two tons of carbon, we wanted it by 2022, I think 2025 is a possibility. So that's what we were arguing for. So I'll just give you a flavor for things that happened there. Sorry about the raucous noise. Miriam, I don't know about anyone else, but I'm not hearing any of the sound coming through from the video, I'm afraid. Oh, sorry. Can you say it? We, we couldn't hear the video, and we couldn't, and you couldn't hear us. Yeah. It, it might be that the connection is not uh, strong enough to uh, stream the video. Miriam, once again, I don't think we're collect we're getting any of the sound here, and it may well be that your internet is not actually strong enough to give us the the streaming alongside your speech. In fact, some okay. of your speech is breaking up. So I think if you can yeah. um, keep no, it as I've turned it off. Yes, perhaps yeah. Um, yeah. simple as possible, we might be able to get more yeah, from listening to you. Yes than trying to listen to something you're streaming. <laughs> yeah. Is it gone now? Yeah, it's gone. Is it gone? Uh, yeah, yes, you've, the video stopped, so. Oh, the sound didn't work. No. Oh, that's a shame. Oh, well, anyway, it doesn't matter. Okay, I just wanted to show you some pictures, but I don't know if I can do that. Maybe that's too difficult. Anyway.
how much more time have we got? Hello? Oh. Hello? 15 minutes, I think. Longer even. Sorry? Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't see that the thing wasn't working. It went a bit strange. Okay. So anyway, um, I don't know if you want to see any more pictures of, of what's going on. But basically, um, some of the things that have been happening this week in COP, you might be interested in, at this COP, um, are um, there are discussions about net zero, as I think you wanted us to talk about. And there was also yesterday the finance, I think it was yesterday, the finance um, day. And many of the world's big financiers came together. And there's a question mark where the green finance, as they call it, um, is actually um, going to deliver anything or whether as Greta has been saying, it's all blah, get constituencies of, of vested interests coming to COP and what they want is to set the stall out and advertise their, their wares. Um, so there's a question whether the, what's been discussed today is deforestation, whether huge amounts of stopping deforestation, products, if you like, um, schemes for deforestation, same with the finance, will actually deliver. And whether net zero, the race to z net zero by 2050 is actually something that will deliver, or whether in fact um, that is a smokescreen um, to um, prevent or to delay real action, climate action, which is what we really need. So there's been a lot of focus today on examining what is really on the table. And I think there's been quite a lot of criticism of the government that you know these schemes all look great and they well make loads of money. But actually, as Greta says, this is not about loads of money. This is about saving the climate and saving the rest of us. So actually, all these um, slogans that can turn up at the moment are regarded in with a great deal of skepticism. I think one of the things that's very clear is that one solution will not work. We need the whole range of the toolbox. And that's why, if you look at, I think you saw, presumably you did see inside the COP um, thing, actually there's so many different methods that we can use. And if we try to just use carbon storage, or we just try to use technology, or we just try to perhaps not eat meat or whatever, that won't be enough. It isn't enough. What's gone wrong is so drastic that actually we need to use the whole range, everything in the toolbox, and we need to make sure that they work. So that's really what's being discussed this week in the COP. And the other thing is that it was a young people's day today. And some of these things are sort of hot off the press from the COPs this morning. Um, and there's a huge feeling that the average age in the COP is over 60 or 65. And yet 40%, um, I believe, of of um, the global, so actually it's, it's people making decisions on behalf of people, other people and a different constituency. There's been quite a lot of criticism of that because the, the youngsters are outside and they're not allowed in. And what I was really shocked about was, but not Greta, and you know, to my mind, and someone like that is a leader, probably the world's greatest leader on climate, and yet she wasn't invited in. And that's something very wrong about that and actually quite spiteful, I think. Um, so there's a feeling also that there's what you might call indigenous porn. Uh, like you may have heard the, the phrase poverty porn. And that is where in the opening ceremony, certainly indigenous people are invited if they are only dress up in fancy costumes so that people can be photographed with them. So they look good. And actually, we've got Indigenous people on our team and they don't dress up, they're real people and they have real concerns and their rights are being completely eroded when people build pipelines, their legal rights and, and everything about their livelihood, etc. and the future, their education, those are the things that matter and then dressing up um, and just making people feel good. It reminds me of the sort of 1800s where, you know, perhaps people with disabilities, you know, we're paraded in circuses. This is really not right. It's really not right at all. So I think there needs to be maturity in what's on offer. And I think it's particularly bad this time. I've never seen it before. And I do think it's an attitude of the idea that this COP is to make a load of money for people. And actually, it's not the United Nations that's doing this. It's the overlay of the government saying, well, this is a media opportunity. And actually, COP is too serious to be a media opportunity. And so there's quite a lot of criticism of that. Um, and also the chaos, you know, one of the reasons I'm down here is because of the absolute chaos up there. All our team got COVID or 
I'm in quarantine actually at the moment because of the mess there. Um, and um, my business partner who had diabetes, I didn't have time to look after him. And I think that's why he's passed away. So I'm quite cross about all that. I think we need a better organization. And I think that if a host country wants to host COP, they need to take these matters very seriously and concentrate on improving the climate and not showing off that to me is really wrong. Uh, so there's quite a lot of that being said at the moment. But having said that, there is tremendous goodwill from all over the world to make a climate treaty with teeth. And by that, I mean halving, I, perhaps you didn't hear it on the thing, halving um, our, everybody's carbon footprint. And what I, I suggest is each person today uses 4.9 tonnes of carbon and we halve it. What you may be aware of, of course, is that most countries don't use uh, 4.9 most at least 60 countries don't even use two tons of carbon so there's a theory called contraction and convergence and that is the ones like america that might use 20 tons of carbon a year can bring theirs down without too much harm and the countries like sudan where some of my team are from or ethiopia need to use a bit more they haven't got enough so actually they can go up a bit and the others can ratchet down and you get this contraction convergence it's much more democratic and it means that you give power to those that don't have it today and actually those that do have too much actually have to rein it in a bit and now people are beginning to talk in those terms at the top and it's beginning to be added to what's called the nationally determined contributions which is each country's pledge and people some of the countries are struggling with that because it's highly it's like a political football so there's those kind of things going on there's lots of different strands to the cop but in the end at the end of next week on Friday, we hope very much there will be a treaty which will limit the carbon usage and methane, as we know there was, I don't know if you know this, but there was 60 countries, I think, signed to keep the methane low. So that's what we need. And the other thing to say is that the climate, if it can go five degrees to two degrees, which is regarded as much more dangerous, so we have no time. And the idea that one can pledge to 2050, 2060, 2070 doesn't work. We need pledges that change the climate now in the next 10 years and actually act to do that. So um, yeah, shall I stop there? But whatever, if you want to see them, but yeah. Would you like to ask questions? Miriam, I would like to thank you very, very much. First of all, for coming on, uh, uh, or, you know, for being with us on Eco Shabbat, and I know how busy it is with the talk conference and making time. And secondly, for sharing so honestly with us about the real situation there and all the disappointments, but also hopes and um, really upsetting from my point of view of young people not being counted in, as you just mentioned. And I saw in the video which you tried to show us how many young people were there. Oh. The so it is so, so shame that we couldn't. That's such a shame, sorry, that we couldn't really hear. Uh, what no, yeah, sorry, I didn't, I didn't see it. Yeah. It was, it was lovely just to see those young people and, and that, that goodwill and they, they, you know, their support. I think it was really, really important. So hopefully it's not going to be just talking now and for the future, but the, the people around the society and young people can actually take power in their hands and bring, bring all people in power over over certain age, M middle aged. I don't know what is middle aged these days. To make right decisions for the future of the planet. So it's wonderful to have Miriam with us, and it's great opportunity to ask actually questions both about COP conference, but also about any anything doing with green economics. And if you've got any questions, now is the right time to ask. Um, Peter Carr, while people are getting their questions ready. Uh, make a comment. I know it's a question as well. No wheelchair access for an Israeli government minister, and it was only her prominence that brought that to the press attention. Boris Johnson refuses to wear a mask while sat next to David Attenborough. How can anyone take the government's preparation and intention towards this conference seriously? Miriam, have you got anything to comment about this? I think we lost it. No, Miriam is with us still. Yes, yeah, sorry, it's a bad line tonight, isn't it? Yeah. Um, okay. All those yeah. fireworks, 
stopping us stopping us from communication but we will will succeed despite of that yeah can i suggest though i really wanted to show you but i suppose i can't it's just too difficult tonight if you go on the cop website and look at the opening ceremony right if you do nothing else just have a look um and in the opening ceremony which i had prepared for you but i think it's just too difficult now um in the opening ceremony are a lot of speeches including this awful thing with boris johnson um Actually, I may be able to put the thing in the chat. Boris Johnson not wearing a mask between sandwiched between Gutierrez, who is the head of the UN, and he's also not young, David Attenborough at 95. I mean, it's just criminal in my, in my opinion to behave like that. Um, but in that whole opening ceremony, there was a really good video from, is it Brian Cox, the astronomer? And he shows how we're just a speck in a, in a huge universe on a tiny planet and it's just 10,000 years in the whole history of the universe, billions of years. And the one civilization that may, if it's 10,000 years, that's a speck. And actually, are we really going to wipe ourselves out that quickly? Is it gonna be the shortest lived thing ever? How silly. And he shows this very visually and we sort of go through the planets and, and through the galaxies. And then another one that I think is worth watching is Gutierrez, the head of the UN, because he explains about, you know, um, the different aspects. And he said, I stand with the young people. They should have been invited. So very clearly, the UN is distancing itself from the behaviour of the British government, which didn't invite them. And also he explains how the different parts of the world, you know, what's happening there and the floods and whatever, and who's suffering and, and whatnot. Very, very good speech, I would say. So the head of the UN is really worth watching. And then David Attenborough did the best speech, in my opinion, he's ever done, I've ever seen. And he explains that at the moment we've got 414 parts per million of carbon equivalent in the atmosphere. And it was about 300 for years and years and years. And actually, that is the indicator, the physics that shows that our temperature is absolutely going to go off the scale. It hasn't been as dangerous. as I've seen different figures. Some say it hasn't been like this for three. I think it's three million years. Other people say 800,000 years. It's really serious what we've done. And graphs are really, really graphic. And they, there's no question in the IPCC reports all over the place. But he explains it in very simple terms. So I would suggest that if you do nothing else, just look at the opening ceremony. I mean, it's quite good. There's some good poetry and whatnot. But those three speeches tell you everything you need to know. You don't need to know any more. And then people need to understand that that's what matters. If we don't get this right, we've had it. We really are getting to the crunch now. If we don't see something now, it's finished. And the other thing I'd like to say is the idea. Oh, that's nice. Thank you for that. Uh, the idea that we can keep 1.5 alive. I really hate that because why aren't we keeping it alive? Paris was 1.5. We should be exceeding 1.5. We should be ramping up the ambition. And I think keep 1.5 alive suggests that we're not going to. And I really, really don't like it. And I think it's blah, blah and greenwash. So very important to keep that language correct. That's so that helpful. helpful. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Miriam. But could you please explain to us, like, you know, small Jewish community, what difference we can make, what really, what really we can do, each of us, and together as the communities, to actually not just to deliver, but exceed the expectations, as it sounds from everyone now, particularly people at COP26, we have, we have to, we need to. Okay, very, very simple. So if you... Um, uh, if you go, if you go on our website, giclimate.org, all the stuff's on there. You can sort of browse it. I've put loads and loads of resources over the years on there. So the first thing is, um, would be that if each one of us looks at our carbon, do a carbon checker. There's one on my website. You can do it anywhere you like, but the carbon checker, right? So what you do then is you get a sort of baseline of what you're using roughly, and they're divided into transport, housing, heating, eating, everything. Okay. And then you can have a look at what you're using. OK, and it's quite a surprise because actually the balance of what you're using can be quite different. And, for example, if you fly to America and back, that's your carbon not gone for the year. So there's lots of things like that. And interestingly, Boris Johnson in the last two weeks used 20 tonnes of carbon, which is 10 times what somebody in Sudan would use in a whole year. It's the same as one American would use in a year. It's just mad. It's insane. And he did it to go on holiday. What is he doing? It's just a joke. So, yeah. So one of the things is check your carbon. And then what we say is ramp it down. So if you've got it, I don't know, 10 tons this week, see if in two months time you can get it down to five. You know what I mean? That is really that makes a difference. OK, and it doesn't matter how you do it. You can have a choice. 
you choose what suits you and what you can achieve. That's the point. Um, so that's one thing you can do. Um, there's so many other things. And the other thing that the head of the UNFCC said, Patricia Espinosa, she said, the United Nations is about nations. That if you elect a national government and that government doesn't give a stuff about climate change, then actually when she's got all her governments in the room and they're all men, right? We saw the pictures that 90% of the world's leaders are men. How is she going to make an intersectional, diverse, inclusive, effective climate treaty? If everyone thinks, well, I'll go to the polls and actually I'll vote for the one with the best hairdo or the one who's most amusing. And she's then going to make them all come around, get elected again. And she said to us, understand, public, that your voting actually affects who's in the table, who's at the table in the UN. So it's those kind of things. Have a think. What is our impact? And the other thing I would say to people is look at your supply chains. If you go in and you buy a pair of jeans and they all come from Bangladesh from slave labor and God knows what, then you're going to find there's a bad carbon footprint. You know, maybe you should buy local. Maybe you should buy more artisanal. You certainly shouldn't have slave labor in there. Do you know what I mean? There are all those things. So look at your supply chains. It's a massive, massive deal with supply chain. It really is. And to my mind, when we started to screw this up, it was when we started buying stuff from all over the place, shipping it around just to where people make a profit and actually no logic whatsoever. So it's those kind of silly things that you might think, well, that doesn't matter. Actually, it's the thing that does matter, the things that do matter. So those things are sort of quick and dirty. And in a way, slightly like the previous speaker, the Paris... COP21, the famous one, they ended by saying we should all go vegetarian, which is different to what was said before. So in other words, there's a lot of cruelty in how we factory farm animals and the kind of cruelty that I think was never envisaged in days gone by when they farmed animals in a small scale way and they honoured the animal. And indigenous communities often thank an animal before they eat it. And I'll never forget, Prince Charles runs a food special private food thing where he tries to change the food train and there's a bloke there called Joska Fisher who had grown up poor in the shadow of the castle where Prince Charles does this it's called Langeberg in Germany and Joska Fisher said when I was a child we were poor and we could only afford meat once a week we never would have it from a packet twice a day three times a day and he said that's what's changed this expectation of mass stuff that we can have whatever we like these things are luxuries and should be treated like that and we should honor the animals and not stick them in this they said dreadful factory cage i mean this is just wrong we know it's wrong it's morally wrong and also we know animals are just as intelligent as ours all those animals we're eating at the moment they're really intelligent and they have personalities and they don't like it they all want to live, we just stop it immediately. It's just mad and it's really selfish. So it's those kind of things I think that we can we can do very quickly. And we were told by um, I think it was Lauren Fabius or somebody who was, you know, head of the Paris cop, just stop eating meat. It's a better idea. Just go veg. But we don't need factory meat, factory false meat. We need we need to eat the plants, not the plant-based diet, I think. We need to be vegetarian, proper vegetarian, which is different or vegan. Thank Does you so help? much, Miriam. I think, but Felix, you will, you, you particularly will make happy Felix. He was arguing with uh, with Adam uh, about a plant based diet completely. So I guess that's that's the middle way of uh, stopping eating meat. Stop eating meat. Mm. So Felix, I hope you're a bit happier now. But it was so important for us to hear what we actually can do, and is by really. Can I, can I just say, say one thing? I I I mean, I, I was really enjoying what Adam said because. Uh, you know, I've been a vegetarian all my life, really more for humanity, like all humanitarian reasons. Um, so I thought it was great that, you know, I'm saying, you know, we should all be vegetarian. Just Fantastic. the thing about, you know, I do like have, Yeah, we, another plant-based about, for you. Uh, night. <laughs> Lovely. So, Thank you so much, Felix. Yeah. I'm saying that we might have another plant-based warrior in our, among, among us. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah, but I thought was what was fascinating, what Miriam, Miriam just said, and particularly relating to um, you know, carbon um, carbon zero um, calculation. So we can do it either on your website or also Eco Synagogue is now developing the calculation of carbon zero as well for yeah. the communities who join Eco Synagogue to enable our communities to, because that's so crucial, such an important tool, absolutely. Thank you so much for that. And we've got a question from Rabbi Richard Jacobi, mm -hmm. who is asking, what would getting it right look like? What would make COP26 a success from your perspective? 
Well, for me, I've been asked to go in on, you know, intersectional, gendered, inclusive, indigenous leadership. I'm talking in terms of those leaderships now. So we've had 10,000 years of patriarchal, we get, sometimes call it patriarchy and accumulation, that's one theory. And actually that imbalance, as we've seen, we've got 90% or 95% male, not necessarily white, but you know, powerful men. And actually the world is not like that. It is not reflecting what the world is like. And not only that, well, I don't know if I can say it, they say, then they say, give a, a woman a fish or give a man a fish and he wipes out the entire ocean. So actually. We need to now be more inclusive, more representative, and we need leadership. For example, one of the biggest, most potent things I've heard recently is science now says that the Amazon was not created by nature. The Amazon was created by indigenous people. That's what the latest science says. And what we've done is we've taken the Amazon away from the indigenous people, removed them, and then we've given it to you know, mainstream economics and they've wiped it out in less than a generation. How dare they and how stupid. We need to give it back, in my view, to the Amazonian people, to the um, indigenous people, and they need to lead on that. We have mucked it up. We've done so much to damage the world and to bring us to the brink that I think it's time to hand the reins back over to the diverse, inclusive, intersectional, the whole lot, and have that beautiful, colourful diversity that is reflected in the COP. I don't want you to go away with the impression that it's not. It's in there. It's just that the balance maybe this time is less because it's so difficult to get there. They've made it so uncomfortable. Um, so, you know, the stress getting up there, the accommodation is expensive, those sort of things. But basically, it is very colourful. And it, that colour, that, that inter, you know, that um, I would say community, that collaboration across the globe is utterly delicious and I think it's the highest form of human endeavour. And for me, I want to see a treaty that reflects that properly and fulfils the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, three of which are about women as well, and make sure that everybody gets a voice there, all the constituencies are represented, and that the mainstream economy one, like the Finance Day, where they basically having all these products what is that to do with saving the climate? Nothing. And the other thing I would say about the money is that, um, I don't know if you know this, but I went to the COP in 2009 in, in Copenhagen and 100 billion was offered a year and it never appeared. And then I went to Bonn uh, three or four years ago and they still wanted, you know, this billion. And then I, I saw the, the less developed countries, as they're called, LDCs group, um, and they were saying, well, we better not say anything about agriculture because we want the money, we need it. And I'm like, you're never going to get that money. And they didn't. And they got nothing because they were quiet, because they were frightened to say anything. And I heard this again happen this time. The indigenous people too scared to say anything, apparently, in a Canadian talk or whatever. They actually handed over to Canada and Norway this week because they thought, well, we probably get some funding. We better be quiet. The money doesn't materialise. So now, apparently, what's on the table is 500 billion because we're five years after Paris and there's more mess and more climate destruction. So now what's on the table is 600 billion a year, which is needed by the less developed countries to even get a foot in the door. And I go to, I'm a rapporteur for, um, I've been a rapporteur for them this year and one of the things that happens is they can't even their internet is even worse than mine I and mean, it's really bad normally mine's okay they can't get that so you'd have the head of the ldc's actually being bounced off by, because his internet doesn't work from say nepal or bhutan where he comes from and no one noticed and i said just a minute that matters so actually it's having a real voice at the table it's really noticing what happens so for me if that, that mechanism that methodology means we really include everyone as we should, uh, excuse, I think it's a big thing, make sure they're really there and get rid of this, these voices, these selfish people that just want to make money. This is not about money. This is about saving humanity. This is about including people. This is making sure people have got enough to eat. And many of the wars, Syria, all of that, they all started with things like droughts. Climate change actually is really causing hardship and has for years, affects everyone, affects the voting. It's time to really look at what's happening. And I think, I've always said, equity is the price of survival if we don't share this world in every respect it's not just climate i think we're sunk that is my honest view does that answer the question uh, yeah thank you thank you so much for being honest but also thank you so much for being so inspirational Miriam, it's been fantastic listening to you and also having this balanced view of a scientist and, and professional and a woman leader 
uh, and and a Jewish and a Jewish person who cares. That's that's been wonderful, absolutely amazing. I can give the last opportunity to our audience to ask you any burning questions if you have any, or to make any comments. Uh, we've got a comment from Rabbi Richard Jacobi saying thank you, very powerful answer, and. Also, I would like to inform you that Anne managed to order oat milk bottles from uh, her own milkman just now. And as Benita said, action, here, now, well done. That's, that's the way forward, right? Just follow up on your new, on, on your can new I just, commitments. Can I just say one thing? Sorry, I forgot to say. And that is, I've always said, if you listen to your inner voice, you have the survival instinct. And the only thing I've ever done is listen to my inner voice because I used to be really sort of tongue tied before. And I found that, that passion is in all of us, but it's stifled by thinking, oh, they say this or they say that in the media. Listen to what your voice says and your heart and you've got all the answers. And I really believe that, you know, there's something in all of us and in all animals to do that. And it, that's why I think, Ignore the vested interests, you know, don't listen to them and come from the heart and you'll find the answers yourself. Thank you very much, Miriam. Uh, last minute, last minute for any comments or burning questions. No. And I would like to bring Miriam, unless you want to say something else. No, that's all right, sorry. That's great, thank you. So I would like to, I would like to ask Rabbi Yuval Kerin to close our evening uh, for tonight, our wonderful event. And from my heart, I would like to thank our speakers, Miriam, first of all, David, I need to be a bit more official, student rabbi, David Yehuda Stern, and Adam Jackson. Thank you so much. You've been terrific tonight. Thank you.